Hey folks, thanks for joining me for this episode of Embellish Podcast, an opportunity for me to ramble about whiskey or something for a few minutes. If you got here by chance, please take a moment to hit the subscribe button. Hopefully I can be found on any podcasting platform that exists, and if you can't find me on a platform, send me an email at embellishpod at gmail.com, and I'll get that taken care of. You can also find video versions of these podcasts on YouTube. You can find all of my links on Instagram at embellishpod or Twitter with the same handle. I have a website. It is www embellishpod.com this is a place to pick up these links episode details and more. all right today i've got devin and chase from american mash and grain and from borrowed page joining me so i'll give you guys an opportunity to introduce yourselves again you've been on before but there might be somebody new listening or watching to this particular episode so um devin on my screen you're in the top right so i'll let you go first um and we'll let chase go second and hope his uh, technology holds out <laughs> yeah here's hoping uh, so Devin Urshaw, uh, co-founder of American Mash and Grain with my best friend, Chase Langdon, also here on the pod. Uh, we started American Mash and Grain back in 2020. Uh, we function mostly as a whiskey website where people can go and we feature a new craft whiskey distillery on the website every month. We do these really deep dive, holistic articles where we dig deep into their history and background process philosophy and brand storytelling strategies as well to try to tell these well-rounded stories that get into the who, the why, the where, the how um, of these sort of incredible craft whiskey brands that are out there on the market. Uh, and then last fall, we released our first ever whiskey that we put together ourselves, which is Borrowed Page Volume 1. And recently, uh, just uh, a couple months ago in early May, we released Borrowed Page Volume 2. Now, for anybody who's listening or watching that's not familiar with the Borrowed Page series, that is where we are working with distilleries that we've previously featured on our website, and we are blending multiple styles of whiskey together. So Volume 1 was a blend of two bourbons, a rye whiskey and a mesquite smoke single malt. Volume two is super different, and we'll dive into the differences with volume two soon. Uh, but we're, we're trying to create products that not only challenge the idea of what American whiskey is and can be, but also try to use it as an extension of what we're doing on the website, which is to draw attention and shine a light back on these incredible small producers by featuring their logos on the front of the label and really trying to use the component whiskeys that we got from them to blend to show off their product. Uh, and yeah, so that's my little two cents. I'll let Chase take it from there. Yeah. Uh, so, so Chase Langdon, um, Devin covered pretty much everything from a high level of about American mash green and, bar and borrowed page. Um, you know, really just to, to get, you know, a, a quick line at it, it all started with the idea or, or the, the motivation to elevate the profile of craft whiskey. Right. Uh, we came together early COVID, um, you know, detached from each other, detached really from our, our normal lives and, and wanted to figure out a way to build meaningful connections, you know, both with each other, but also back with the craft, uh, these independent craft producers across the country and really wanted to tell our story. And, and, and Borrowed Page is, is not as much our product as it is a, as an extension of that idea. You know, these stories that we're trying to tell and these kind of uh, the, the new collaborations that we can facilitate um, on that platform. So, you yeah, know, really excited to be talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and, and you mentioned this, so, you know, the, the, the website is kind of the genesis of all of the things, the mashing grain, and, and I'll put links, um, in the details or show notes or bio or whatever, wherever this ends up getting posted, um, different places, there'll be a link to the mashing grain website and then everything else that we're going to eventually talk about as well. But, um, you, I think you've said before that these blends will always be someone you've already featured on the American grain, American a mashing grain website, right? Um, what are the characteristics of a distillery that's going to put them in your sort of spotlight for getting featured on the website? Yeah. Um, you know, there aren't any hard defined criteria, um, you know, and, and, and honestly, even with, with both volume one and volume two, there's been a lot of distilleries that we have featured on the website that we would have loved to include in bar page. And, maybe as we were trying to put these pieces together, we couldn't quite figure out its place. So just because they weren't in one of the first two volumes doesn't mean they're not in consideration for the future. Um, honestly, I think one of the, the big things we look into is, you know, what is 
their story, right? Like we, we really want to partner with the people that um, we feel like have a great message, have a great purpose. And, and honestly, everyone we've talked to through the website has, has had that, but um, there are certain stories that, that you can't help but like, walk away from the conversation. You'd be like, oh my God, like I feel motivated to, to go out and, and, and try and do something great. Um, and then honestly, like we're looking for people who are doing something different, who, who are kind of open-minded enough to want to take a gamble on the bar paid product with, with us who are, I mean, we're a couple of years into it, but we're not these massively known um, brand in the, in the whiskey space. So we need to find someone who's kind of open-minded enough to want to engage in a productive partnership with us um, through the bar and page series. Yeah. I think Chase nailed it. A big part of it is just being aligned. I think on like an ethos and mission level, like, you know, a lot of times we're asking for a little bit of help sometimes on the pricing of these barrels, you know, we don't make a big profit off of these. In fact, all the money that we made from volume one so far, Pay, went into paying for volume two. I foresee that that's going to be the case for a significant amount of time until these things start selling out like very rapidly, which maybe will happen one day, which would be cool. But, um, you know, the point in with borrowed page is not to make a bunch of money or to just put another flashy brand on the shelf. It's to try to push the boundaries. It's to support craft I think there, you know, the one thing that's been so wonderful to experience over these last few years since we started the website is just how, just how much camaraderie there is within the craft whiskey or craft spirit space. People are really supportive of each other. I think there's a concept that a rising tide floats all ships. So we're looking for people that are, that are aligned with us on that idea that this is not something that's going to, you know, break open the bank for anybody, but something that could help be a part of the conversation that will push American whiskey forward. Um, and yeah, we've, we've tried incredible whiskey from pretty much everybody that we've featured on the website. So everybody's in contention um, for these first couple blends. I think we're just trying to think about the flavor profiles that we picked up when we did those features, knowing how they put those things together and trying to imagine how those whiskeys would play together in a blend and trying to be somewhat selective in that process. All right. So, um, as you guys sit down to, to think about, you know, obviously, uh, you said, you know, volume one is paying for volume two and volume two will probably pay for volume three. Um, do, do you sit down with like a, a hit list of, of people that you'd like to partner with for the next blend? Um, and, and sort of how do you go about creating that list? Right? Like, uh, I'm not going to ask for any specifics on what the next list looks like. Cause I assume it's probably already in your brain, if not on paper somewhere. Um, but how do you, how do you generate the first version of that list? Yeah. We, I, I would say the first we were, when we've made volume one, we were so completely consumed with, with volume one. There was no looking even, you know, two inches in front of your own face. Um, and then when Devin and I, we were in Kentucky uh, blending and bottling volume one, we were on a connection flight back, um, that that first leg and we got stuck on the tarmac for I don't know, it must have been an hour or two hours and like literally not even into the air um, on the return from blending volume one. That's when we really started um, ideating in earnest about who would be in volume two, volume three. Um, and, and so we are we have kind of started making a, a list, um, you know, it evolves. Right. It, it's sort of like uh, a choose your adventure. Like, all right, if we go with distillery A, for example, you know, the, the knock on effect of, all right, who would we pair that with, you know, creates a different variation of what a future volume can be. So like you, you, it's, it's a little bit of like, we have a large cast of people we're thinking about, but then when we start talking about blends specifically, um, who we choose for the first distillery impacts, who we choose for the second one and, and so on and so forth. So like every time we talk about it is kind of a variation of the previous conversation. Yeah. I think it's also, it's somewhat conceptually motivated for volume one, kind of like what Chase is saying. I think we, we really flew by the seat of our pants a little bit. I think with volume one, we, um, you know, the first distillery that expressed interest in the idea was watershed distillery in, in Columbus, Ohio. So we kind of knew what that first component was going to be. We knew it was going to be bourbon after that. It was just trying to think like, 
who do we know and who have we spoken to that we think will be supportive of this idea that will go with watershed kind of like chase was saying um we knew alan bishop would be aligned with the mission uh we thought whiskey del back and that mesquite smoke single malt would be a really interesting curveball that would help with the whole concept of sort of challenging the flavor profile of american whiskey um and then Wiggle Whiskey, we knew we wanted a rye in there. Wiggle Whiskey was the first distillery that ever gave me a job in the industry. So they make an incredible rye, but it was also just a little bit like a personal thing for me. So that's how volume one came together. Volume two came together much more around a concept and that concept being uh, no bourbon in this blend. Um, that was where Chase and I started in that conversation waiting on the tarmac um, was volume one was like 58% bourbon. There was two different bourbons in there. Volume two, we just drew a line in the sand, no bourbon. And then we just kind of took it from there. And that, you know, that's sort of how that process started. And with the ideas that we've been kicking around for volume three and volume four, it's a similar kind of thing. There's a there's a concept for what that blend is going to be. And because of the concept that is leading us towards certain distilleries to, to go to. Awesome. So I think I heard in there that you have both volume three and four already uh, being planned. So that's super, super encouraging to hear that there's two more yet to be planned. Um, Just TBD, which, which concept is three and which one is four, (laughs) you know, we we don't know which one is the next (laughs) one. We have two solid concepts. So, and I, it, you, you sort of touched on it, but I'm going to ask, you know, it, is there, is there some portion of this that is, you know, managing personalities and I don't necessarily mean managing personalities of the individual distilleries, but that may matter as well. But, um, if you've got something like a whiskey Del Bach in there, um, you probably don't want to bring in another peated or smoky or anything else. I mean, how much of that goes into play of you get your key, you know, stakeholder, and now you got to build out the rest of the, the team, how much does that go goes into play? You know, the, the managing of the, the personality of the whiskey or the distillery for that matter. It's a good question. Uh, I don't actually necessarily know. I mean, I do think it would be weird to mix like a mesquite smoked whiskey with like a peat smoked whiskey. I think you, I mean, do, figuring out how to blend with mm-hmm. smoke is challenging enough, let alone trying to do multiple styles. Now that said, I can't say that we would never try to do something like that in the future. I think Chase and I maybe need to like get a few more notches in our belt in terms of as blenders to, to reach that thing. But I think similar to what you're kind of getting at something that we have thought very consciously about is that, you know, like we said, we want all these distilleries to be aligned with us, but we know that we need at least one of them to be like a real champion of this idea um and alan was that for volume one all the distilleries were super supportive i'm not trying to discredit any Mm -hmm. of them but alan was a super big fan of the idea super big fan of the blend and he just kept you know tooting that horn wherever he Mm -hmm. could and so when we were thinking about volume two for example uh we were trying to think who could be who would be people that would similarly sort of attach themselves to the project like that. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the things that led us towards Mammoth, for example, because we knew that Ari Sussman and Chad Munger up there at Mammoth would be really big champions for this idea. Um, So I think less so about worrying about personalities or conflicting styles of whiskey, because to a certain extent, I feel like that, is a a little bit in the DNA of what we're doing anyway, Mm -hmm. which is trying to blend weird and different things together and create something beautiful out of it. Um, It's more about finding that champion that's going to, you know, go along for the ride with us. And to a certain extent, we also had that with our guest blender for volume two as well. Mm -hmm. So when you're selecting, are you actually selecting the distillery? Or are you actually pushing in a little further and saying, I want this particular bottling that you have or offering that you have, not necessarily bottling, you know, uh, you know, because I think of, you know, Alan at Spiritual French Lick and he's got like 47 different things going at any given time. Are you just saying, hey, we want French Lick or hey, we want French Lick's bourbon specifically? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think the inroads is 
the 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 distillery, the person, you know, mm-hmm. how they're going about it. Uh, I mean, Devin can speak more specifically, but we do put in certain requests, but we don't want to be limiting, right? Like, I think a part of it is um, the interesting piece is like we're taking things that probably shouldn't otherwise fit together, and then we're letting them submit into all right, we want something in this range, but you know, kind of open. Um, open up their options. We don't want to kind of put them in a the corner and then they submit to us a bunch of stuff. And then we go figure out how it's going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is sort of this anxiety of like, will it work? Can it work? Um, kind of risk that that's taking place. But I think that that adds to just I don't know, the excitement of it. And, 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 you know, we're, I think we've made two fantastic blends that are, are very different from one another and we haven't been proven wrong. And really that comes through, you know, the success is really coming through the fact that, we're, we're partnering with people who are going about their process in the right way, who are producing a wide range of products. And there's a general faith that like, if we go, if we share in that kind of like, we go about the right way and, and we have a, a dialogue that, that is both collaborative in nature with the distilleries, but also with our guest blender, that we can find a path where the end product lets each individual distillery's product shine through, but also has kind of a perspective of its own and, and an expression of its own self. So you, you've 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 touched on it a couple of times, and last year's blend, um, Ann helped you guys with, and this year it was Ryan um, from, and I can't remember exactly what his handle is, but everybody who does anything on TikTok knows exactly who Ryan is, it's the the other Ryan guy or whatever. That it is, one Ryan, dude, Ryan. That one dude, Ryan. There you go. I couldn't remember it right off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> he's uh, super charismatic. You know, I've had some back and forths with him. That sounds terrible. We've had some conversations back and forth over social media in the past. Um, and so he was this year's, and I believe I read in the materials, the intent is to have a guest blender on each one of these. Um, so how did you end up with Ryan? Like, how did you decide Ryan's the guy that we want to go after? So Ryan was super supportive of the first release. Um, I think, you know, I initially sent him this, this shows a little bit of my like naivete or whatever of this whole business of which I still have plenty. Um, but I sent him like a, like a hundred ML sample of volume one, not even realizing that like his whole thing is like slamming bottles on a, on a table and like pouring them and doing his sort of like quiet review, you know, facial expression Mm -hmm. review. So obviously he's not going to slam a hundred ML bottle, but He did respond to me via social media or email. I can't remember, but he was really impressed with volume Mm -hmm. one. He told me that, you know, he's a part of a couple different whiskey societies and culinary circles uh, out in Florida where he lives. He was sharing it with chefs. He was sharing it with other people in the industry um, and really getting it around. Mm -hmm. So I just really appreciated that, that even though I sent him something that he really couldn't work with at all, uh, for his social <laughs> channel, right? That he still liked it, and he still was like willing to do something about mm-hmm. it. He liked it so much, so we did eventually get the guts to send him a full size bottle. He did the slam and sips review. We saw a nice little response on our end after mm-hmm. he did his thing. Um, and yeah, I mean, he's like you said, he's super charismatic. He's a really, really nice guy. He's really knowledgeable. Um, you know, he's been a part of tasting panels for Penelope bourbon. He's done, you know, uh, bottlings for Sagamore spirits and, and other brands Mm -hmm. like that. He does single barrel picks all the time. Um, he's got a really great palette. He was a big supporter of the idea. So I just floated it by him at one point, if he'd be interested to do it. And he was really enthusiastic to be a part of it. He had never been a part of something that was going to be available nationwide, basically, Mm-hmm. Um, so he was really excited to be a part of it and, you know, it doesn't hurt that he's got a hundred thousand followers on TikTok and 30,000 right. followers on Instagram. So we saw it as a, as a way to work with somebody really great and, um, and hopefully get a chance to connect with his audience on a deeper level. So did you have kind of the, the distilleries nailed down by the time he came on or did he come on like earlier in the process? We, well, (laughs) again, we do kind of fly by the seat of our pants a little bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's Chase and I both times, both releases have kind of been like, these are the distilleries that we're going to go with. 
um, with volume one, we got shot down a couple times and pivoted mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Volume two, we were lucky. We actually got, you know, first choice for these three distilleries. Um, and I think we hadn't really locked them down yet when, when we started talking to Ryan, but, and, and for a brief amount of time, I think I floated it by him. Like, who would you be interested in working with? And then he just like, didn't respond for a little while. <laughs> He's a busy guy. Yeah. Uh, and uh and so eventually i just came back and was like here's what we're thinking and then he was just like i love that he's a big fan of uh virginia distillery company i don't know that he had had talnua before but he had had mammoth so um he was excited about the concept and luckily we were able to come through with those distilleries yeah and and you mentioned you mentioned mammoth you know i've 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 had an episode uh with ari as well um and he's probably one of the most interesting people. Um, and, and I guess when I go back to the question of like managing personalities, uh, what I really more meant is like, if, I, I think if you put um, Ari and um, Alan in the same room, then you don't get to be a part of the conversation anymore. Like they're going to, they're going to have a conversation and you're just going to sit in the side. Um, and you almost like uh, a kid being invited to the grown ups table for dinner. Like you just shh, be quiet and let them talk. Um, they, they, I, I, I like that you know kind of Ari becomes Ari becomes the the anchor um that that Alan was in the first blend for the second blend makes a ton of sense he's a super guy um doing super interesting things they're both uh, really close to each other but you know so your first blend was kind of Ohio Indiana Pennsylvania and Arizona right and this now this next blend is Colorado Michigan and Virginia I don't know if you guys intend to repeat distilleries or not, but do you intend to repeat states or you're not, you're not even considering like, Oh, we've already done Colorado. We're not going to do Colorado again. Listen, there's a, a loose awareness, right. About mm-hmm. where we're going geographically, um, both in the written form of the website, but also in the product itself and borrowed page, but it is not the highest, you know, you know, thing that we, we criteria mm-hmm. that we make our decisions based off of. Um, I think, you know, where we're at, the, the, the decision driver for us is really is that concept and that mission, right? You know, we have our kind of a creative concepting that we want to do, but for the purpose of furthering our mission of pushing the boundaries of what is American whiskey, um, of shining a light on these amazing people producing amazing products all across the country that aren't in Kentucky and Tennessee that, you know, maybe someone in Pittsburgh is unaware of what's going on in Columbus, Ohio and watershed and, and so on and so forth. We want borrowed page to be this platform that, 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 that connective tissue that connects kind of different parts of the, the country. So um, we're aware of it. If we can go through the country without repeating, I think that'd be fantastic. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, it, it's, it's bouncing a lot of factors and it, I wouldn't say geography is our, primary driving force i think we'll at the very least we will probably try to avoid repeating a state like one after another yeah. like i you know i we uh eric wolf from stolen wolf approached me shortly after we released volume one um expressing some interest in in you know being a part of the project at some point i love stolen wolf i love their story i love the product they make we had just had uh wiggle in it mm-hmm. so you know i was you know when we were thinking about the rye whiskey that was going to be in volume two stolen wolf would have also been a great product to put in there uh but we had just done wiggle similarly like we love uh liberty pole also in pennsylvania also in the sort of western pennsylvania pittsburgh adjacent kind of area um so, you know, I think we'd love to work with Jim Huff and, and those guys over at Liberty Pole, too. So I think it's these I think it, it would be very silly for us. And of course, living here in Colorado, we are I am surrounded. We are surrounded by a bounty of incredible distilleries doing incredible things. Um, you know, the feature that we have on the website right now while we're recording, which is June, uh, is Storm King uh, in Montrose, Colorado. And they're doing awesome stuff too. So I would never want to say that we could never go back. But like Chase said, I think similar to how we run the website, we're just going to try to maybe block a few other states in before we, before we come back around. You know, and I, and I think, you know, this this may be a, a, um, 
kind of a, a weird question. Maybe it's a weird question. I don't know. So, you know, you have these different states that are sort of represented in, in Colorado, Michigan, and Virginia are all kind of doing different things, similar things, but different things. Um, so Talnua is, is going Irish. Uh, Virginia is trying to sort of create their own version of a Scottish single malt. Um, and, and, and your Michigan is, is rye. It, you know, it, it's rye. Do you think, you know, I've read several reviews where, you know, kind of their understanding of what borrowed page, vo borrowed page volume two is, is that the sum of the parts is greater than the individual pieces. And I, you know, I kind of think that's a, that's a concept of a good blend is that when you put all three of them together, they sort of rise a step above that. But do you think that the individual characteristics still power through enough where you feel like, like Colorado, Michigan, and Virginia have all kind of put their stamp on this particular bottle? Yeah. It, listen, I, I understand in, in, in there's a, a school that's thought that says blends need to be greater than the sum of their parts. Um, mm -hmm. You know, by virtue of our mission, it's really to lift up these other distilleries, right? To, mm -hmm. to So I, I think what we're aspiring to do is not make something that's essentially greater than the sum of the parts, but it's something that you can enjoy the distinct contributions of each yep. of the individual parts. And at equal level, the blend as a whole is, um, you know, a good representation of a high quality, but also like deserving of the care, the passion, the hard work that these independent craft producers are putting into their products. Um, really, Devin and I have the luxury of going and, and cherry picking final products and we don't have mm -hmm. to go find a farmer. We don't have to transport grain. We don't have to, you know, mill and mash and ferment and do all these things that are, are incredibly laborious. And, and so we don't necessarily want to think of borrowed page as something that that outshines the individual components more so it is a platform for each of the individual components to shine through. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I do think we, we have been successful. Obviously, I'm going to say that I'm, I'm biased in, in my <laughs> uh, assessment of these things. But I think that the thing I'm most proud of for both volume one and volume two is that when you taste it and, and you sit and sip on it, like there are times I sip on it and I'm like, oh my God, like there's Talnua or for volume one, I'm like, oh, there's definitely the mesquite from, from Whiskey Del Back. And you, you get these kind of glimpses back into what we appreciate about, appreciate about each of the individual producers before making the blend. And then every once in a while I'll sip it and just kind of enjoy the big picture of the whole thing and, and, and the blend itself and kind of the art artistry and the craft that went into the blending. Yeah, I like that. And and I hadn't really thought about the 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 some of the parts thing sort of being almost insulting, but it very much could be. Right? I I get that now. Like I I put the pieces together and, and when I think about, you know, I think about it from a, a blended whiskey that, you know, uh, somebody's blending a whole bunch of bourbons together where they're trying to use one whiskey to hide the fault of another whiskey. Um, when I look at a blend like what you guys are doing, uh, I think when when I'm saying the greater that the sum of the parts is greater, it's because it is it doesn't just taste like four things pushed together. It's four things that are blended together and they create something that's distinctly unique, you know, and, and each one can kind of play a role in that flavor profile. Um, but it becomes greater only because it's a perfect marrying of these f three parts that wouldn't work any other way. But it's a really, really good take. I like that. And I'm going to kind of keep that in my uh, in my pocket there. Um, and Devin, you well, said this, well, go ahead. Sorry. And John, I think, I think you nailed it for me with the mm -hmm. word unique. I mean, I wish there was a less cliched or less <laughs> overused word to, to do. I think I, I try to use distinctive cause I'm mm -hmm. like, that means the exact same thing, um, right. but isn't unique, but yeah, yeah, it's the sum of the parts is something that is high quality, well-crafted and, and, different, mm -hmm. challenging, distinctive, unique, whatever word you want to use. That's what the sum of the parts is, 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 is something that you've never had before, but in, you know, at the same time, exactly what Chase is saying is like, it's to show off the hard work that all of these distilleries that we're working with have done and sort of to your point. Yeah. A lot of times when you're blending products, you are trying to maybe hide that this barrel got over oaked a little bit or, you know, this one's a little young or this has kind of like a very spicy note, but that's okay because we're going to blend it with this stuff. That's really sweet. Like, um, you know, when, with what we're doing, we're not trying to hide anything at all. If anything, we're trying to showcase the best part of each of these barrels that we pick. Um, mm -hmm. and like you said, hopefully blended in a way that doesn't just feel like a bunch of stuff smushed together. Like Chase said, 
shows off the whiskey that we used and also creates something dynamic and bold and complex and different. Yeah, it, it becomes more symphonic, you know, where you're like, oh, well, I can hear the strings down, the strings fade out, and now I can hear the horns. Um, Chase, were you getting ready to say something? No, but it, okay. Devin, you should stop using unique and start using symphonic. That, that symphonic is, is friggin' amazing. <laughs> that, that, that's, I'm not sure if it's a real word or not. I'm about to Google it over here. In a second. I, 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 I don't I know. I think it is. It's got to be right. Real or otherwise, it's my favorite word of the day. So. Yeah, so I'm I'm glad I could give you that. But so way earlier, Devin, um, you 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 started a sentence and then you backed up on a word and you said it again. And I'm gonna come come uh, made a note. I'm coming back to it. You said craft whiskey and then you backed up and said craft spirits is sort of this interesting thing. Um, and that kind of stuck in my brain. Like, are are you guys considering other things than whiskey for future blends? Well, I'll say no. Pretty much. Okay. We're, we're a whiskey company yep. and to a certain extent, at least for, for the, for the time being, what I'm most interested in, in doing is figuring out how to blend whiskeys together to challenge that idea. Now that said within this very loose definition of American whiskey that we are very purposefully playing under, um, you can release an American whiskey that has other spirit in it. Mm -hmm. um, to a certain percentage. Now, normally the sort of bad connotation that's come with American blended whiskey is because people have been blending in neutral grain. Neutral spirit. Grain. Yeah. Um, but you know, that opens the door that we could mm -hmm. throw something else into a blend that helps add a flavor component or a flavor note or an extra texture or dimension to it while still, allowing for it to be called American whiskey. Um, it's not in borrowed page volume three or volume four's concept, but mm -hmm. I won't say that it's, it's something that we'll never do. You know, Alan and I, a long time ago, when we first started conceptualizing this project, he was talking about, you know, you know, you could throw some brandy in there. Mm -hmm. Um, and that would, you know, still be considered American whiskey. And that's an interesting idea. Um, so not saying no, but we are a whiskey company. That is our focus. Okay. Yeah. Cause I actually go ahead. So I was just a piggyback back off of that one. It will never be vodka either. So not neutral. You just yeah. nothing, no clear, like, you know, liquors probably. Um, and then I, I would say, you know, there is enough things and directions we want to go explore, right? We have two clear mm -hmm. concepts defined. We have a lot of concepts and, you know, kind of these nascent stages that, you know, if we, clearly just say whiskey is it, which was the original concept for Bard Page and American Mash and Grain, we could spend our entire lives never really finding that outer boundary of what American whiskey really is or can be. Um, so it's, you know, if we do make that pivot, it's, it's, you know, it's, we have some curiosities that are going on, certainly in our home blendings and our back bar and, you know, uh, but nothing that we're really looking for Bard Page right now. But I, I think, you know, the frontier of American whiskey staying strictly within the lane of whiskey is so big still. Um, yeah, okay. that we were not really thinking about it in a serious way. Yeah. And I guess I, that's a really good clarification you made in there because I wasn't leaning towards like a neutral grain or a vodka, but I was thinking about, um, at the Kentucky bourbon festival two years ago, uh, Dr. Heist was talking about, he had some distilled, um, sorghum sitting in some barrels in a rick house. Yeah. Right. And sorghum, because it actually came from the cane, is going to be more similar to rum than it is anything else, but it's aging in new new oak. Um, and so it's not going to really come out like whiskey. I'm thinking like these very um, historically appropriate uh, distilled spirits from North America, but they may not fall within that. So brandy falls in that, in that realm and um, like a, a sorghum grain whiskey um, or, you know, kind of any of these things that are just sort of weird and unique and funky. That's what I was leaning towards, but yeah, good, good call out. No, I wasn't asking if you're going to put neutral grain in there. Um, and that was more the way it was leaning. Uh, one of the other things that you've said a number of times that you guys are shying away from Kentucky and Tennessee spirits um, and maybe not necessarily shying away from it, but not wanting to showcase it because that gets a lot of it. Um, but if, if I was a craft distiller in Kentucky or Tennessee, like how unique would I need to be to, to be in consideration for a, a mash and grain well we have featured um distilleries in both tennessee and kentucky um we featured old dominic in tennessee we featured wilderness trail 
with Dr. Heist and, um, and Shane out in um, Danville, Kentucky. Um, and we may or may not have some more features coming out, you know, soon from that general area. Um, I think what it is, is um, they have to be doing something a little bit different. And granted, that's something that that's an expectation or that's something that we're looking for across the board pretty much. Um, but I think maybe, maybe unfairly because of their location in Kentucky or Tennessee, we really want to see them pushing a boundary, um, or doing something a little outside the bounds, everything that wilderness trail does with their yeast production and everything that Pat heist, um, and Shane Baker have put together with firm solutions to create that, uh, that system they have over there. Also how they've grown from producing eight barrels a day to 200 barrels a day in such a short period of time. Um, and you know, really have grown in some people's mindsets beyond the term craft and into something more like a lower level commercial, you know, larger industrial commercial distillery. I think that's, that was interesting. That was something worth talking to and talking about. And then with old Dominic, you know, you've got, uh, you've got an incredible female master distiller heading up that operation. And you also have a historic brand sort of being revitalized. Um, and you have a kind of a new player in the Tennessee whiskey realm, which, you know, as, as much as Kentucky dominates bourbon, you know, that domination is still split up between heaven Hill, Jim beam, four roses, Woodford reserve makers of Mark, you know, to name a few in Tennessee, there are a handful, but like there's two juggernauts, there's Jack Daniels and there's Dickel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to talk to somebody who is doing Tennessee whiskey in Tennessee with a female master distiller revitalizing an old brand and, you know, sort of their take on what Tennessee whiskey is, was also a story that was, that was really intriguing for us. So those are just a couple examples of things that would draw us into that region. So I think, and and you you can tell me if I'm wrong here, but the the spirits that have been featured so far in Borrowed Page is largely single malts, bourbon, and rye. Is that is that correct? Did I miss anything? Single pot. Yeah, I mean the single pot is certainly a, a different style in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I would say if you want to break it down to grain, which yeah. I think is probably the thing. So far, yeah, we've we've pretty much dealt in corn, rye, and barley, for the most part. Right, and so I guess where, where I was sort of heading is that there's this there's this um, growth in wheat whiskey and corn whiskey, just plain corn whiskey, just straight 100 percent corn whiskey, and then rice whiskey. Um, do those kind of factor into the potential future of borrowed page? You know, like hey, we want to get the rest of these spirits kind of uh, percolating in here too. It- yeah, again, I think uh, we're, we're motivi- motivated by trying to find people who are doing interesting things. Certainly, if you're playing with new grain varietals, especially if there's geographical relevancy. Like I live in Louisiana. I think every distillery in Louisiana should be putting out a rice whiskey. And some of them are and some right. of them are because it's so native to the area. Um, you know, so I, I think our ambition certainly covers all those things. The, the reality is... Um, you know, it, it's still part time. So, you know, a, a little bit of what we're deciding between is maybe we just haven't gotten around to tell that story. Maybe we haven't found the right, right. partner who are doing those sorts of endeavors. Right. We're not going to go just put someone in borrowed page just because they're making a rice whiskey. Mm-hmm. We want to go through the process of learning their story and, you know, figuring out what makes them tick and what motivates them and, and, and what their purpose is for doing what they do. Um, and then after all of those check marks, OK, then maybe we'll consider them for borrowed page. It really is actually, if you think about it, a, a pretty extensive, uh, you know, uh, process for being considered into borrowed page, even though we're kind of in a situation where beggars can't be choosers. Um, <laughs> we, 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 we definitely want to be a little bit thoughtful in that fact. So, yeah, I think that's what was so exciting about American Mash and Grain and also specifically borrowed page is that. We have a couple concepts lined up, which we think are new stories to tell and redefine American whiskey. And we haven't even begun to scratch the surface on some basic elemental pieces like grain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, and, and this is, 
this is tougher and tougher to find, but um, are you guys interested in trying to explore like a like a peat element in the future? I know because there's very few people that are working with North American peat, and I didn't know it was a thing at all until about two years ago. Um, Alan Bishop was talking about it on Distillers Talk, and he was like, "Yeah, there's there's peat in Northern Indiana," and I was like, "I didn't, I wasn't aware of such a thing." And then he came, he comes out with a whiskey witch. Um, you know, peat's one of those things that's super divisive, and if you're trying to build a brand, maybe that scares people away. Maybe it encourages them to, to be a part of it. I don't really know, but um, have, have you dipped your toe into Pete yet or thought about it? I have a couple ideas of how we could use Pete um, in these. I actually haven't even talked with Chase about it, but um... <laughs> I'm very well, I'm so I'm excited to hear. Listen, I, to I'll, I'll mute my microphone and you guys can talk right now. We'll just, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Nice try. But uh, <laughs> no, definitely. I mean, um, it is a classic whiskey flavor at this point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is divisive, but you can't discredit what Isla has done for peated whiskey. Um, I think probably two of Ch both mine and Chase's favorite whiskeys in the world are probably Lagavulin and Laphroaig. Um, We are two Laphroaig you know, major supporters. So we're on the, we're on the side of the fence that's into that weird, funky peatiness. Um, but how we factor it in might be surprising. We'll, you know, we'll see. Cool. I think I've only got like maybe one more question that I have. Um, oh, here's, here's, here's a little one. This is going back a little bit. Um, so whenever you come up with, you know, you guys have featured all of these people on your website. Um, so you likely have bottles of them around uh, before they ever send you anything. When you kind of come up with the list of the people you're going to participate with. So, you know, this round you've got your three distilleries. Do you ever just got pull those bottles off the shelf and make a quick blend and be like, okay, I can see how we might be able to make this work. Um, honestly, no, not for, not on my end, at least. <laughs> listen, I, I, I think, um, I don't do a great job holding on to my samples, right? right. Like, he really does Yeah. It, it, and then I'm either drinking it right away or I'm sharing it. And if I'm sharing it, it's with someone special. Cause like, like I, I, I don't do a great job of that. But what I will say is, um, on my back bar, I'm constantly blending random stuff and like, okay. A lot of times, yeah, listen, it, it, it doesn't always work out. Every once in a while, I'll get a, oh, this is a, a good mental note. And then you kind of can say, oh, like a really spicy rye with a really sweet, like, you, you talk about it in generalities and figure out how that might transpose into, um, you know, some of the distilleries that, that we, we featured on the website. Um, very rarely do I have the luxury of self control where I have a, a, you know, a giant palette of samples left over and I can start playing around. It's, it's, it's not like that. It's like he, they won't even last like a couple of weeks, John. We'll get samples from the distilleries that are for tasting notes for the website, for the articles. Mm -hmm. And I'll come to chase like a week or so before we publish and say, Hey, like, what are your thoughts on these? Or like, should we talk about this? And Chase will be like, oh, those are gone. <laughs> like I didn't and I didn't write anything down. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, Wait, it, and I'm a big subscriber of uh, tasting notes shouldn't be more than the whole like Siskel and Ebert approach. Right. It's either mm -hmm. one thumbs up with me and one thumbs up with Devin or you maybe, you know, two right. thumbs up. With totally. That, that should be the totality of the tasting notes. I understand there needs to be a little bit more communication and intention. Well, behind. then Chase, go ahead and join with, you know, Kenny Coleman and Ryan Cecil at Bourbon Pursuit and do their whiskey quickies then. Cause that's oh, their really? whole rating <laughs> process. Oh yeah. I don't, but, I don't, I don't, uh, listen to that. I don't know. But. I, admit, I mean, admittedly, John, and maybe this is like not wise to admit, but like, I actually do very little like, uh, recreational blending. Um, I drink whiskey pretty much every single day. Uh, it is my favorite. Like my kid is in bed. Finally, I'm going to go mm -hmm. out on my back porch and like drink a glass of whiskey and watch the sun go down kind of a thing. Um, and now that I'm, I'm working full time as a distiller, uh, I'm obviously drinking, you know, I'm drinking a lot of new make. I'm drinking a lot of stuff along the, the process. What I do think is lucky with me is that I have a pretty good memory. If I drink something, I am I'm pretty good at being able to go back and remember what that experience was. So I think 
what I lack maybe in, in recreational blending practice that Chase, you know, is doing, you know, with all of his samples that he keeps, uh, I maybe make up for in just having a pretty good uh, grasp or, or memory of what those flavor profiles were like, and then being able to sort of imagine what mm-hmm. could work together in my head. Hopefully that keeps working out. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't think that, you know, there, there's, there's nobody that's going to listen to this and be like, Oh no, you're making a terrible mistake. Cause I mean, the, the proof <laughs> is in the pudding at this point. I mean, you, you guys have put out two blends that have been, at least in my opinion, a uh, pretty fantastic um, from, from people who have almost no distillery background other than you guys ran a website. Like you guys decided at one point in time, Hey, I want to open up a long form website um, in a time when long form websites are starting to die off. Um, but it's been successful, right? Like I, you guys have seen incredible success with it. So it says you're doing something right. You know, it's the, the focusing on the storytelling portion of it. Um, and that seems to be a common thread amongst some of the most interesting distillers and distilleries is that a lot of them are trying to escape soulless corporate machines. They want something a little more romantic and a little more um, to pay homage to their, your, their lineage or whatever. Like they want to kind of have this higher degree of attachment um, they sort of reach out into these realms um, in that vein. Uh, who should I be talking to in the next year? Like you guys are on the forefront of knowing what's happening with craft whiskey. And, you know, we, we had a whole episode at the end of the year where we talked about craft whiskey and what's going to happen. Um, who, sh- who should we be looking towards uh, in 23 and early 24 from the craft whiskey game? That might be surprising or that isn't surprising. I don't know. I mean, they're fresh in my mind because they are our current feature. And also it was the first article that I personally wrote in like two years. Um, But Storm King in Montrose, Colorado, uh, their side gig, American Whiskey, which is a blended product, you know, not too dissimilar from what we what we do, but they're doing doing it all in house. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just won the world's best American whiskey from the World Whiskey Awards. So a, a monumental achievement, um, not only to, to, you know, get best in category or whatever, but then to, to get world's best, um, really great. They've got a fascinating story. They, their process is really interesting. They, they're experimenters. And I think that that's really cool. They, I've worked for a lot of distilleries that kind of do the same mash bill or do the same thing. 70% of the time or, you know, a lot of the time at the very least. David from Storm King was very upfront in saying that he he gets driven crazy when people ask him what the mash bill is for his bourbon because he's put out three different batches of bourbon and it's been different mm-hmm. every single time. And he has a whole warehouse filled with bourbon barrels and almost every single one of them is different. Different grains, different percentages, mm-hmm. different oaks, different char levels. So... I think what they're doing with being adventurous and being experimenters um, is really cool. And I think gives them a lot of latitude to put out some very interesting products now and in the future. And if they're already pulling in major hardware, like world's best whiskey from world whiskey awards, you know, just, you know, five or six years in, um, they're pretty impressive. So I think Mm -hmm. they're, they're definitely one to watch. At least that's, that's top of mind for me. Yeah. I mean, just to keep a a quick brief plug, but I I would say Liberty pole as well. You know, it's um, they've intentionally, I think, tried to stay a little under the radar um, as they've, they've kind of attempted to perfect their, their mash bills, their process. They're in the process of, of, of expanding right now. And I think you'll see that product get a little bit, more broader visibility and accolades. Um, but when we tried that a few months back, I remember thinking it was like, this is a place that is, you know, doing like the product is noticeably different and incredibly high level for how under the radar they, they kind of seem to be. So I would say Liberty Pole is, is definitely one to go look at. All right, so I'm gonna put these on the on the short list now, and I'll I'll link the articles you guys have on Liberty Pole and Storm King in the details as well. We're gonna have I'm gonna have just as as many links as I can possibly put. Just be obnoxious because apparently that's supposed to be good for like you know RSS feeds and for yeah yeah it, it huge for SEO yeah you know, there you go whatever it is. Um, 
couple of last things here. Uh, I, you guys are, are working on on guest blenders. Uh, I, w- I want to recommend uh, either David from Whiskey in My Reading Wing or uh, Chris Blattner. You guys should use either one of those guys or make them blend together uh, because I would love to see um, David's analytic nature up against Chris's kind of loose, very cool guy. I, I think it would be perfect. I want to watch them struggle against each other. I think it would be beautiful. Um, are you guys going to be doing any festivals or going anywhere with product this year? Um, we are going to be at the ADI conference in Las Vegas in August, which we're really excited about. Um, also very exciting is that the, the ACSA conference is going to be in Denver, Colorado next year. Um, Mm -hmm. so it'll be, you know, right in the backyard. Um, so we'll be at that, uh, in terms of festivals and stuff. Um, I, I, we'd love to have booths and, and be, you know, talking to people and sharing the story and have a banner out there or something. Unfortunately, we're, we're somewhat short on funds for that kind of stuff right now. Mm -hmm. So right now, um, we're really focused on just trying to do what we can to get borrowed page volume one and volume two out there as best we can raise some money so that we can fund volume three and, uh, and just keep this, keep this thing going. All right. Um, any hints on what volume three is? Uh, I have one teaser that I've been giving people. Should I do the same teaser again, Chase, or do you want to do one? Yeah, no, no, you can do it. <laughs> the teaser that I've been giving people is that uh, my, the, the concept that I'm most excited about pursuing for volume three would require a distillery that has previously told us no to change their mind to yes because of what the concept is. So that was, that was, that was actually in one of my questions earlier and I kind of bypassed it of, you know, like you guys said, you got a couple of no's on, on, um, volume one. Are there any people that are now that were no's before that are now soft no's or potential yeses for the future? Cause they saw some success and some, some movement on that. But, um, you know, t- tell us who they are and we'll pester the shit out of them until they change their mind. And like, let the consumers do the work. Uh, wow. No, I'm not gonna I know you don't that, want to do that, but I will say at least one of them was a, I would say was a soft. No, they, they had never and still have not ever sold their whiskey to anybody. Uh, um, and they did tell me on the phone that if they were going to sell their whiskey to somebody that it would probably be us because of right. what we're doing. So like you're not what bearing my, it behind a label. You're, you're, you're promoting it. Yeah. What my hope is, is that we can come back to them with volume one and volume two and see, and say like, see, I wasn't mm-hmm. just blowing smoke about what we were, what this was about. Now that yeah. you see it in reality, can, right. you know, what do you think? And I think the concept idea, right. Helps yeah. further give mm-hmm. credence to, to what we're doing. So tying back into the last bit of question, um, you know, there's been some pretty significant sex success with volume one that may turn some no's into yeses. Um, can you tell me some more about the ways in which volume one saw success? Did we have some awards? Did we get some, you know, did Fred minute give it his golden ascot or whatever the hell it is that he does? Like what, what, what happened with volume one that's going to help them change their mind? Well, Fred Minnick certainly did not give it its, his golden ascot, but we also we did not submit to the ascot awards this year. We won uh, the website won a double platinum marketing award from the ascots a couple years ago, which was you know a great honor and it was a good uh, you know it was good I don't know proof that we were doing something right I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but for Volume One, uh, it did win silver medals from both the International Wine and Spirits Competition and the San Francisco World Spirit Competition. Um, At International Wine and Spirits, it won silver medal with 94 points, which is absolutely amazing, except that 95 points is gold. So it's just about the most painful way to win silver, uh, (laughs) in my opinion. Uh, It reminds me, I used to love, um, I mean, I I love stand-up. I used to perform stand-up, but I used to love this Jerry Seinfeld stand-up where he talked about the Olympics, and he had this whole thing on silver medals and it was like, you know, congratulations. You almost won, you know, right. No, but what's, no, the bottom, what, what's the bottom end score of silver though? 
<laughs> yeah. I have no idea what the bottom end score of Let's silver. Just say but 90, points, like if you got a 90, it means you almost didn't even get a silver. Like right. that's got to be worse than getting a 94, which is almost a gold. I guess maybe yeah. uh, win win yeah. win a ninety four, John, and tell me how. <laughs> Listen, Listen, man, I, 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 I had a lot a of seasons in college, so I, I I feel pretty good about saying, hey, I'd rather be on the low end uh, or the high end of a B than the low end of a C. So yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, what, what was cool about the ninety four points was seeing how Borrowed Page Volume One scored compared to some other absolutely phenomenal whiskeys. I think. We scored higher than Blanton's Gold. We scored higher than all of the E.H. Taylor releases from last year. We scored higher than a li- uh, than um, than Eagle Rare Seventeen um, Year Bourbon. Um, and I know people who clamor over trying to get Eagle Rare Ten. So to beat Seventeen was pretty cool. I think we tied Weller Twelve. We tied some other great bourbons. So to be to be in the same conversation or in some cases even ranked slightly higher from a competition of that level um, for our first release was, um, was super humbling uh, and just an incredible experience. So uh, we're excited to get volume two into some competitions to see how it does. But, you know, it's, it's funny. We're, we're making products that are, as we've hit over the head, purposefully different. And so you never know, especially in a blind tasting, how those things are going to land on people's palates. Because, you know, if you're a big bourbon fan, for example, volume two, which has no bourbon and is very malt forward, that might not hit the notes that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, If you, you know, if you like you know, sweeter traditional bourbons, then volume one might not be it for you either with the rye notes and the mesquite smoke. So, um, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to continue to see how they do, but we're very, um, we're very, we're feeling very positive coming off of the first volumes release and the success that it's got, that it's garnered. Yeah. Those competitions are just super scary. Like they've got to be at least, I don't, I don't have anything in it, but they've got to be super scary for you guys because I was at a um, small tasting that Peggy No uh, was hosting a couple of weeks ago. And she was talking about going through and, and being a part of some of these tasting panels for these competitions and the number of whiskeys they taste in a given day. What did they drink before you? What are, what did they eat through the course of that day? They don't have perfume. Like there's so many variables that can play against you. Um, specifically when you're trying to be very symphonically unique um, <laughs> that you could end up. Yeah. You like that? I, I gave it, it to you. It felt um, much more natural that second go around. They could, they could, they could come back and it could, it could, it could sort of kick you because it is so distinctly unique um, in there. And so like to, to come out with that. Now I assume there is no more bottles of volume one anywhere. Is that correct? No, they, uh, we still have about uh, about half the inventory, I would say. Okay. A volume. So one. somebody can still sneak out and grab these silver metal bottles, and at the same time, they probably need to go ahead and buy volume two because um, if volume one was silver, then volume two is probably going to pick up steam. It's going to be a, a silver. Maybe it's going to be ninety four point four. So it's a round <laughs> down. It's still at ninety five. Let, let, let's let's fully you know, promote to gold. Um, right. But where do we go to buy it? Like, I, I've, I haven't asked you guys that yet. I've, I've, I've failed as a host here. Um, so where do we go to buy a bottles? Because that's what you really need to happen. Yeah. So uh, right now we're, we're sold online. Um, the, the best place to go to purchase our bottles, if you go to our website, uh, www.mash, the letter N, grain.com. Um, it's also where you can get all of our content. Um, again, this is all part of the larger endeavor to, to promote these independent craft producers across the country, but go to mashinggrain.com. Uh, across the top, there's a store page right there. You can go to that. Or if you scroll down, you'll, you'll see the big bar page promotion right there. Um, we are also being sold at, um, some, uh, social media stores online. So our, our, um, collaborator um, in the blender uh, that one dude Ryan if you go to any of his stores through his social channels you will be able to access it well as well but um, we shipped to 47 states I believe now um, so sorry Utah um, it's your own choice um, uh, but anyone else you, you, you can get it. <laughs> sorry Utah Utah Hawaii Alaska sorry 
Yeah, Listen, you, you, I understand the Hawaii and the Alaska, and I really understand the Utah. And I was going to ask this earlier when we were talking about Michigan because Michigan's in this blend, and a person from Michigan is called a Michigander. Um, and that's one of the silliest-ass names of people that I've ever heard <laughs> until I went to Utah. Do you know what a person from Utah is called? No. Utah, a Utah. 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 Just add an end to the word Utah. And that's, but at least that's all better than Hoosier. Right, like I like Hoosiers, like as, as a name, but like it has no right. relevancy. Like it's like it, Indiana, it maybe, but like right. I don't know where the Hoosiers it makes no right. damn sense. Well, I mean, but I, like, I like it. Still sounds ridiculous. I, I I like it too, but like you know, draw outside, like, draw outside the box. That's what you know. That's what mm-hmm. we believe in. It's like everyone else is some variation of the state name, and they just took a hard left turn. Right. I don't know. Yeah, the, yeah. it's. It, I think there's another one that has a weird uh, renaming of people that's like that. But um, volume two, you can actually get in a smaller bottle if you needed to, right? Like you can get. Yeah. This in so a- we released about seven hundred seven hundred bottles of the first release of volume one. We released about the same number of full format bottles for volume two, but we added around three hundred half size bottles, so three hundred and seventy five milliliters, and that's because we wanted to offer. Uh, a slightly lower price point to somebody who maybe was interested in trying the whiskey, but didn't want to commit, you know, cause you, you know, because it's exclusively sold online, you have to factor in shipping, you have to factor in tax. That's going to all add on, add on top. So the half size bottle gives somebody an opportunity to spend a little bit less money, try a product that we think is really cool. And then hopefully come back for the big mm-hmm. bottle after that. Um, and as long as, you know, there's inventory of both, we're selling it in a two pack as well. So you can buy volume one and volume two together. And there's actually a slight discount uh, mm-hmm. for buying the two bottles together. And while you're at it, you need to go ahead and get like two more bottles. Cause you get flat shipping on four bottles, right? That's right. And yep. you've got some picks and you've got some other stuff that's floating around on the website. Um, wouldn't hurt. Just go ahead and get four bottles at one time. It'll, it'll make life simpler. Now, am I allowed to talk about the Easter egg on the bottle? Yes, please. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so I because I didn't know about this until I saw it on somebody else's social media. It may have been Chris. I don't know from from Urban Bourbonist, um, but the American Mash and Grain sticker. If you peel that off, you get Ryan's logo behind it, and I assume that had to do with some TTB um, stuff. Yeah, you can see my sticker has been torn off. So let's see. I can do this. There you go. Don't see this whole beautiful silhouetted face, but. I'm yeah, right. I'm turning it the wrong way. My hands don't work. It's all <laughs> weird. Anyways, there, 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 there is, there is the logo. It's behind the sticker. You guys had to cover it up, I think, because of TTB. At least that's what yep. I read. I could be wrong. Yeah, basically, I mean, uh, I am very. This is mostly on me. I am very mm-hmm. fastidious about uh, delivery dates or deadlines. Mm-hmm. I should say that I set. Um, and no one is imposing besides me. Um, but I have a very specific vision on when things need to happen and Mm -hmm. am very rigid about that. Uh, and part of it too, is that when we, when we submitted the label cola for volume one, we got approval in like 48 hours on Mm -hmm. that label. So going into volume two, I was working under the, the same assumption, but here we were over a month after submitting the label cola and we still didn't have approval and we had changed virtually nothing. Mm -hmm. So it was getting to a point where if I didn't tell the label company to start printing our labels, we were not going to hit this deadline. That was important to only me. (laughs) So I went ahead and I told the label company to go. And about four days later, the TTB came back and they said very you know, understandably, you can't have the words blended with and then just a picture of mm-hmm. something. You have to explain what it was blended with. Um, and I think it was easy enough to infer that we were saying this person in the picture right. is who we blended with, but it was not a fight that we had time to deal with. So we had to cover it up with a sticker, which is very sad. And, and for all those people listening who aspire to make their, you know, release their own product and file a, a label, you know, to, to get approval from the TTB, uh, if you have two versions of the same logo, for instance, a 750 and a 375, 
and one gets rejected for this rationale or any rationale and the other one gets approved, do not think you should go back to the TTB and tell them, well, you approved it over here. So can you go ahead and, and approve it on the 750? What they're going to do is actually remove the approval of the 375 <laughs> and leave you with no approvals. So yeah. Um, yeah. And maybe Don't one last, it. one last parting piece of advice. Uh, really take a close look at the labels that you're approving from the label company. Because if your 375 milliliter label says 750 milliliters on it, <laughs> then you're going to have to get another sticker to, to cover that one up too. <laughs> nice. Yeah. No, I've, I know yeah. I've heard of several brands that will just resubmit the exact same label and eventually get approval because it comes to someone else's desk and they look at it and say, it's perfectly fine. I've heard of people submitting the same label three times and whichever one gets approved first and they retract the other two. There's other there's there's ways I've heard of other people dealing with that. I yeah. think it was Blake from Sealbox and Bourboner who was like, just submit it like eight times. Yep. And like one of them will get approved. That 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 may have been exactly who I heard. Because I couldn't remember if it was a distillers talk episode where actually I think it was on or... I think it was on our craft whiskey roundup. I think it was on our <laughs> round table. You know, it, it, maybe that's why I remember it. <laughs> It wasn't someone else's podcast. It was something I it was, was actually yours. doing. I was a part of this, and I just don't remember. <laughs> that was a long time ago. A lot of things have happened since January. I was just glad that you and I are remembering the same thing. The same Right, moment. yeah. That just do it over and over again, and it'll eventually get approved. Um, but I have heard elsewhere where somebody will just submit the same one again. Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, cool, no problem. So it, it depends on if uh, you're getting Friday work or you're getting Monday work from, from the individual people. So I don't have any more questions today. I'm sure I'll derive some. Um, do you guys have anything else that y'all need to talk about? I mean, otherwise, it, uh, really just check out our website. Like I said, www.mashtheletterngrain.com or really any of our social channels, that same at mashtheletterngrain.com. Um you know, you're going to learn all, you keep up to date with all the, the stuff about Bard Page, but really you'll get to see all these independent craft producers that we're, we're working with across the country. That really is the primary focus of our content platforms. Um, and so if you have a passing interest in craft spirits, um, it is a great place to come and really just spiral down the rabbit hole with us. Yeah. And I just want to quickly, we, you know, we talked a little bit about what's in volume two, but I'll just get a little bit more like micro on that for a second. So it's uh, it's rye whiskey from Mammoth Distilling uh, up in northern Michigan. We actually have two barrels of their rye whiskey in, in here. Uh, one of them is just kind of their standard woolly rye, but the other one is this really cool version they called RTB, which stands for Royal Tannenbaum. Um, it's called that because it was a 53-gallon barrel of their woolly rye that leaked, so they had to recouper that into a 30-gallon barrel. So technically, this is a double oaked version of their woolly rye. It's also a little bit older and a little bit higher proof than their barrels typically get. Um, and it lended a lot of body and a lot of mouthfeel and finish to this whiskey. We have two different American single malts from Virginia Distillery Company in Lovingston, Virginia. One single malt that was aged in a first fill Oloroso sherry cask and one that was uh, aged in a first fill red wine cuvee cask. These whiskeys bring incredible sweetness and depth to this uh, to this blend. The sherry cask is bringing a lot of raspberry and strawberry notes. The cuvee cask, a lot of spice and darker fruit, dark cherry, dried fruit notes. And then finally, we have Talnua Distillery from Arvada, Colorado. They make American single pot still whiskey. And for those of you who might be semi-familiar with that term, pot still whiskey is traditionally an Irish style of whiskey. It's where you're making a whiskey from a mash bill that includes both raw barley and malted barley. At Talnua, they do a 50-50 split. They tr uh, triple distill that in copper pot stills and then age it in new charred American oak barrels like a bourbon would be. And the whiskey that we have is actually from their Continuum cask, which is more of their Solera method. So those uh, barrels get dumped into a big giant oak fooder. A little bit gets drained out at a time for the next batch. And then more whiskey gets added in on, a to added in on top of that. So it's sort of this constant 
blending mingling process uh, that creates this really incredible, rich, flavorful whiskey that is light, but has this incredible mouthfeel to it. Um, and I think that that shines really brightly in the blend as well. So some really, really interesting whiskeys with some really fun stories are here in volume two. Now, I'm going to go back. Did you say that it was RTB for Royal Tannenbaum? Royal Tannenbaum. I love that. <clears throat> so this is the sample that we got. So, mm -hmm. you know, normally when you get samples, it'll look mm -hmm. more like this, you know, it'll have a number on it. Uh, or maybe it'll have a combination. I'm trying to see if I have one. I don't. A combination of letters and numbers. It's almost never this. <laughs> In quotation marks. I like just that. letters. So it's a yeah. situation where I had to call them up and be like, so what's the deal mm -hmm. <laughs> with that? And that's when they told me the story. Yeah, I like the, the the there's a there's a movie nerd in me that's really excited. That's what the name of it is. Um, I've got awesome. some RTV so, right here. Yeah, and um, I guess Chase, where's your sample bottles? Oh wait, you uh, drank them all. Yeah, they're long gone. Them. But yeah, no, they're long. I, I I will say I am in the process of moving, and I have dubbed what I'm doing my back bar Operation Bottle Kill. So like, there really is not much left to be spoken of, though. I did drink these long before I started Operation Bottle Kill, so you know. <laughs> you didn't have to tell us that part. I mean, I mean, I assume Devin already knew, but you didn't have to tell me that. Uh, are you? Where are you moving to? I'm, I'm moving to Colorado. Oh, to, to so be closer Devin to will Devin, living, I assume, right? Yeah, and it, we'll both be living in the Greater Denver area. TBD, where I'll be living. Devin's already been to a showing for me and my wife to try and find a house for us. Um, but we will be living in the same state. Uh, for the first time since we were 18 years old. Um, so, you know, really exciting and honestly really excited for the potential for American mash and grain because uh, this remote nonsense has been logistically challenging to say the least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We so can actually do a... these. We can actually do these blends together in person. Yeah, it's it's going to be wild. Yeah. We can yeah, use my micro pipette that has the right, uh, you know. <laughs> Third time is the charm. I'm going to get the right micro pipette. <laughs> I'm sure there's some there there's there's some some uh, inside uh, inside talk that's happening, there. Uh, but I won't. It's I won't been a, it's been a comedy of errors with Chase getting the right equipment for these blends. It's Listen, been hilarious. So it's just I, easier. I'm just don't the, buy the equipment. Move to Colorado. Just move to Colorado. Don't you have to buy the equipment then? No, no one's. You know, Devin did not start this company with me thinking like, you know what, Chase. He's the precision guy. You know, like we, we, we need him getting uh, the whiskey down to the exact milliliter. No, that was never never the vision. Um. <laughs> it, it, it feels very much like that. So um, I appreciate you guys taking some time out on Father's Day um, and, and hanging out with me and, and talking through these things. Um, if there's anything else you guys have, if not, then we'll we'll call it there. Thanks for tuning in for this offering from the Embellished Podcast. If you enjoyed this, please leave me a review on whatever platform you have to be consuming this on. Leave a comment if possible. Hit me up on social media at Twitter or Instagram using Embellished Pod and give me a follow so you can keep up with what's going on here. I can also be found at www.embellishedpod.com with all of my links, account, contact details, and more. Thanks for stopping by.